It is now February, maybe March uh, 1977. Um, by now, I am alone at Rushinga. Uh, uh, I haven't had uh, uh, another special branch man in, uh, from uh, Salisbury for, for months. So I'm running the whole thing at Rushinga by myself, which is quite nice. It's how I wanted, how I quite liked it. Anyway, um, I get intelligence that the um, Zandler base at uh, Ruya magazine is pump pum with uh, material, uh, that is ammunition, mines, weapons, you name it. Um, and this is for a big push about to start into both Chaminuka and the Honda sectors. Uh, consequently, I uh, I call Jock Darwin, um, speak to my boss, Robin Harvey, there, and uh, uh, fill him in, and uh, um, he said he would uh, speak to the Jock about it that day and then come back to me ASAP. The result was uh, early the following morning, um, a guy arrived in a in a uh, army Land Rover, a uh, jeans T-shirt, um, long hair, amiable, um, not a big guy, and introduces himself as uh, Captain Bob McKenzie of the uh, SAS. Um, basically, what happened then is uh, Bob and I sat down and go through everything I've got which includes taking out the, the, the whole file. I, I had quite a file on Ruya Magazine by then, um, on Ruya Magazine, and we went through it. He said, okay, what you'll do now is um, you'll have to do a, a, a bit of a recce. So uh, um, I got engineers. We went up to uh, the Cordon Sanitaire, and they, they cleared a path for him. He went by himself. Um, he was gone two days. Um, then two days later, he reappears at Rushinga. He says, "Right, everything is as you say, as you say it is." So it looks like we do not have a moment to lose. So he radios Darwin, and uh, within a couple of hours, his um, uh, his section of the SAS were there, um, about twenty guys, and um, the jock is calling in, uh, called in the whole of the RLI support commander no. to go in with them. Um, just out of interest, sake, what happened is um, they brought two brand new 50 cal brown eggs with them that were going to be uh, placed onto um, uh, their two fives. Um, but they hadn't got the mountings. Um, so one of John's sergeants, an American guy, ex Vietnam, um, knew exactly how to do these mountings, but we needed welding equipment. So the um, the DC, uh, Arthur Birk, uh, had a workshop where there was both electro and oxyacetylene welding equipment. And I was familiar with welding as well. Um, we, we, I've done quite a bit of welding on the farm. So this sergeant and I uh, went down there with the two fires and spent, um, it must have been virtually the rest of the day, building these mountings because Art didn't quite have the correct steel there, you know, so we had to improvise. But we, we got it done, got the Brownings mounted, uh, back up to the base at Rushinga. And this is now the only time I managed to fire at, uh, a 50 cal. When test firing the weapon, uh, uh, Bob said to me, go ahead and fire a few rounds. It was <laughs> quite a good feeling. Anyway, um, then uh, uh, early the following morning, support commander arrived and the raid was ready go, to go in. I then asked to join them. And I was told on the pain of death not to. Um, I just wasn't allowed to go external, which made me quite angry, actually. But there you are. Anyway, they went in, and the raid was a total success. Um, they killed about 40, which is, in terms of externals, isn't much, but that wasn't the object of the exercise. The object of the exercise was to recover uh, uh, arms and ammo and material, etc. And with that, it succeeded beyond all measure. They also captured a uh, eight-ton Zul truck and basically loaded this truck up to the gunnels and then Bob drove this truck back to um, through through the cordon sanitaire into to Rushinga. The rest of the stuff they just carried back any way they could and it was like a treasure trove. You know, you name it, it was there. So 
whatever push Zandler had planned uh, uh, um, for that period was, you know, be, became nothing. So, um, yeah, that was a good one. And um, my source had did have something to do. No, he wasn't totally responsible for the intelligence, but he was part of it. Okay. Then go to April 1977, and um, I get a senior man coming in again from a newly promoted detective chief inspector who was basically going to win the war single-handed. Um, no names, no pactual, except for, I will say to those who were in the BSAP, that his nickname was the Midnight Cowboy, and they will know whom I'm talking about. Anyway, <laughs> this guy was going to win the war single-handedly, and he started, you know, pick up some... He, he started torturing again, and I have a thing about torture. Uh, I had not tortured in all my time in both Rusebo and Rushinga and run well with it. And now here is this oak. Um, I got quite angry about it. I confronted him on it. Um, and he then told me to join him in the torture. I refused and I was put on a charge. I was charged for disobeying what he called a lawful order. So I thought, fuck you. Um, I got all of the jock. I said, I'm not working with this man. You can charge me. You can detain me. But... I'm leaving, and that's what I did. That is actually probably the main reason I left Fushinga. Um, aside from that, um, he had gone behind my back, um, gone into the source files, contacted my source, and wanted to meet my source direct. Now, this is something you don't do, but his point was it was a special branch source, not my personal source, and therefore he, as my boss, could have access to the source. The end result was the source disappeared. All those years of work gone. Yeah. So those are the reasons I left Rushinga. Uh yeah, you know, not very pleasant way of yeah. You know. But yeah, that's that's basically why I left Rushinga. I then went to uh, uh Robin Harvey and I said, I need to leave. I need to get out of here. I uh, informed him what had happened. Um Robin just shook his head and you know, I suppose he can't talk against a fellow officer. And um I said, I, I need to go and leave. So um, uh, he said, fine. I went to PJHQ. Uh, I said, right, uh, how much leave have I got left? How much can I take? And um, they gave me three months. So um, then we went overseas. Uh, um, Annie, uh, who was my girlfriend by then, uh, and I and a friend of mine from the Air Force uh, called uh, Rob Fish and his girlfriend. Um, we flew to Germany, and I found to my uh, pleasant surprise that uh, my biological father had been paying into an account to keep me, but uh, ever since we had left for Rhodesia, my mother hadn't touched it. So there was like, oh, what was it? Eight years' worth of payments sitting there, which was a small fortune, about 20,000 Deutschmarks. So I used that money to buy a, a car, a station wagon, Ford station wagon, uh, we bought tents, uh, an inflatable boat. And yeah, we then hit the trail. And from northern Scotland to southern Spain, we've been there. Um, <laughs> interesting thing is we, we spent quite a bit of time in London with some friends. And if you walk down uh, Portobello Road, Portobello Market, on a on a Saturday, you'd bump into so many Indonesians. And uh, most of the guys were wearing their camo jackets, so they were easily <laughs> recognized. And... Um, I found lots of people were doing the same thing as us. Uh, they just wanted time out, you know. Um, in retrospect, I said to myself, what a way to run a war. Um, my uncle, who was in the German Paris, was gone for six years. So during those six years, he came home four times, and three of those were because he'd been wounded. So um, were we really fighting the war? But, you know, uh, okay, uh, it's it's a point to ponder on. Anyway, I come back from leave, um, report to PJHQ. They said, you've been transferred. I said, okay. You're going back to uniform branch. I said, what? Okay, fine. Uh, yes, uh, you are to report for duty at Goromonzi. So I go back to uniform. Initially, I was 
quite resentful, but uh, and immediately put in an application to go back to SB. But there you are. So I became a uniform branch uh, patrol officer in late 1977, went to Goromonzi. And to my pleasant surprise, I quite enjoyed it. Um, Goromonzi was a happy station. It was a chief inspector's posting. Um, during my time there, there were two chief inspectors. One was called Vincent, and I don't remember the other one, but they were both absolute gentlemen. Um, the two I see uh, was an inspector. Uh, he was also a farmer as well as a policeman. So he was like a part-time inspector, something I never come across before or since. And there was the, the, the section officer was called Alan Sharp. Alan had just been made up to P.O. married, and he married a woman patrol officer, so it was pretty much a police family. And there were, I think it was four patrol officers. One was Peter Vessels, who was become, to become a very good friend of mine. And of interest is, is that Rob Parker and his SIS section also stayed in the mess when they were not in the bush. Now, Rob Parker is well known in SIS circles and police circles anyway. Um, his SIS work was um, groundbreaking, let's put, it, let's put it that way. And um, for all his successes, he, um, he got a medal. He became a member of the Legion of Merit. And um, his section uh, included uh, a fellow called Peter Bristow, who was the son of an ex-commissioner. Peter was a giant of a man, but uh, basically we all became good friends, you know, um, which included um, Rob's dog, Toby. And Toby used to sit with Rob at the bar and drink uh, beer out of a bowl, you know. So Toby got drunk with the rest of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's the first time I came across Mike Norton who uh, was the SB man for the area, or just been appointed the SB man for the area, although he was a reservist by then. He wasn't a regular, he was a farmer. And then um, his, his, his second work was uh, to run special branch come ground coverage for the whole of Goromanzi, which included some TTLs. Uh, uh, I think it was a Chikwakwa. I'm not sure right now. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, but this was way before of enterprise and, and everything, you know. Um, yeah, of interest uh, is uh, part of the area we, we had included Rua. And in Rua, you had Oscar Salamis. Oscar Salamis was a German called Oscar, who was about as wide as he was tall. He obviously used to sample all the salamis when making them. <laughs> but uh, he, had a, he was a veteran of World War II, and he had a, a Luger pistol uh, back from those days so him and I did a deal where I used to give him 9 mil ammo for his Luger and I got free salamis now I got so many salamis I hung them up in the bar and under each salami was a plate with a knife and when the oaks came in to have a few they used to have the ability to cut some pieces of salami and eat instead of built on it worked a treat because eating salami makes you thirsty and I drank more beer so the bar made more profit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, right. What Goromonzi, of course, is the Arcturus murder. Uh, um, I was the first on the scene. Basically, um, the call came in. Uh, uh, I was a duty patrol officer, so I, uh, uh, I jumped into my Land Rover with my constable, uh, went out to the road, um, and... I found this Puget 504 station wagon where it had been uh, uh, where it had been advised. And um, getting out, I see the state. It was an open piece of ground. Um, it was on, on either side. There were fields. Uh, uh, um, rather, it was meadow for cattle. Um, so the 504 had broken through the cattle fence. I went up to it and I found two uh, deceased uh, um, the European men uh, uh, in the vehicle. My first thoughts were double tapping because uh, uh, on the one side of the vehicle there were only two bullet entries. Um, I could see the other man had been shot straight through the head, um, also double tapped. So the bodies were quite a mess. So I radioed this in and uh, and then Mike Norton came out and uh, he had a look at the scene and I said, if this is meant to be a, um, an ambush, there, there's something wrong here. 
because um, normally at ambush sites where uh, AKs uh, have been used, you find plenty of uh, spent uh, cartridge cases. There were none. Um, so I instituted a search myself and, and Mike Smith and my, you walked up and down the road, zero cartridge cases. Um, so Mike then called in um, CID, scenes of crime or whatever they were called, I can't remember right now. And they came in and the whole thing became quite a woo ha ha, you know, uh, every Tom, Dick and Harry was there. Um, after that, I must admit, I wasn't really part of the investigation. I know how it all ended up. Um, I think the only thing I did is, in order to uh, assist with searches for uh, any sort of evidence, I mentioned to um, Mike that uh, there were some guys doing coin training nearby from Depot. So uh, they all joined in. So, yeah, that was that. Um, uh, and then, uh, as you know, the, how the rest developed is the man was caught. The money was found, a uh, uh, large part of it down a riverbed, the other parts in his pickup. And, uh, yeah, and that's how that all ended. Um, otherwise, I was just doing a, a rural policeman's duty, um, which uh, was pretty much routine in a way. Um, uh, one incident comes to mind is um, we had a roadblock I'm sure it was a Chiquaqua TTL on that road. And uh, he had a roadblock there, and the roadblock got hold of the station. And he said, there's a vehicle that's just broken through the roadblock. So Peter Vessels and I get in our um, uh, Land Rover, and we set up our own unofficial roadblock a bit down the road closer to Kuramonzi, and there came this vehicle. When... We put our headlights on the vehicle, and it was full of Africans. It was just bomb, bomb with Fs. And we shouted at them to stop, and they didn't. As I went by, we both opened fire, and we just made this vehicle look like a Swiss cheese. Uh, and the result was, I think it was eight dead Africans, men and women. They just, God knows what the idea of this driver was. There were no terrorists in that vehicle. There was just some guy who was probably as drunk as a skunk driving his friends and family through a war zone, breaking through roadblocks, and that's the result. Yeah, so we, we went to Rauri Hospital that night to deliver all the bodies, and we sort of felt quite shit about it. But, I mean, what were we to do, you know? That is just what happens in war. Um, I think the, the only other incident worthy of notice uh, yeah, cats are unlucky around me. And it was six o'clock uh, uh, in the morning. Yeah, I was on duty as uh, was duty PO. I get a call out. So I go to my Land Rover, start the engine, and instead of hearing the burring of the motor, I hear this unearthly screech. Oh, jeez, what's going on here? I open the bonnet, and dripping off the bonnet are pieces of cat. Basically, this thing must have gone to sleep on the engine, you know, still warm at night. And then its tail must have been near the thing imaging that it goes around. What's it called? Um, yeah, anyway. Um, when I started the motor, the cat just got chewed up. And that was that. So needless to say, <laughs> Land Rover had to be steam cleaned. And <laughs> I had to use another vehicle. Yeah. Okay. I spent, uh, it was three or four months at, um, at Coromonte. As I say, it was quite a happy time. I then get a notice from uh, the 2IC of the district, a bloke called Dubuque Thomas. I'm being transferred. Now I'm going to a place called Darwindale. And Darwindale is a two-man station located on top of a little copy. So the approach to Darwindale is quite steep. Um, so you, you drive up and then you come to the station. And there's me and there's a section officer. Not a happy time. The, the SO and I did not get on at all. Um, he, he was just a, he was a by the book man, you know. Uh, everything had to be just so by the book. And I had this big mess all to myself, little bar, but no one to drink with. <laughs> um, and uh, an unhappy, relatively uneventful time, um, except for it was a time where all the agriculturists were being installed. So. The uh, agricultural people got hold of me and they asked me if they could um, put their caravans for their staff. 
at uh, at the uh, at the grounds that the mess stood on. Stood on. I said no problem. Turns out both agricultural technicians were Irish, and no joke. One is Catholic and one is Protestant, and they were all armed with sidearms. And then one day after work, we are, the three of us are sitting there drinking, and as I got drunk, you know, the talk gets to religion and the troubles and all the rest. The next thing is. It's like gunfight at the OK Corral. These two blokes are drawing their pistols on each other. I thought, shit, what am I going to do now? So I just shouted at them. I hit the one and grabbed the other, grabbed both of their weapons, and I chased them off the property. I said, take your caravans and elsewhere, you know. Um, that was the only really exciting thing that happened. Otherwise, I became public prosecutor. You know, I prosecuted in court. But the, the crimes that what crime was committed at Dawanda? It was illegal possession of fishing nets, you know. So I was prosecuting people for illegal uh, uh, possession of fishing nets. And I had to supervise the caning of uh, juveniles who were naughty, you know, who were given a, a sentence by the court to be caned. Um, and caning was, in those days, it was a legal punishment, you know, just a major corporal punishment legally. And um, it was carried out by uh, uh, um, members of the prison section of the prison service. And I, as public prosecutor, had to witness and then sign off that the sentence was properly carried out. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, thank God, um, I got my uh, application for transfer was approved. And so was my permission to marry. So any standard and I, any standard became any Sittic. Now, the first point in that procedure is any has to go before a board of police officers and she has to be found suitable to be a policeman's wife. <laughs> now, that was how things were done in those days. And uh, needless to say, any passed the test of flying colors and permission to marry was given. Um, right. Annie's brother, Adrian Stander, and I had become very good friends during the time that Annie and I were going out. And Adrian was to have been the best man at my wedding. Two weeks before the wedding, um, Adrian and um, the dad, Um Ben, were ambushed. And Adrian was killed. So, um, and during the same ambush, uh, Ben got shot twice or three times, I can't remember, but one of the hits that Ben took was in the shoulder. So, yeah, it was, it was quite a trying time for all of us because um, Adrian had been a good friend of mine, as I say. Um, so, Annie and I were considering, are we going to go ahead with this at all? You know, should we delay it for a couple of months? But but then Um Ben said, from the hospital of it, we are going ahead and that's that, you know? So we did. And at the wedding, he was dancing with Eddie with his shoulder all wrapped up uh, from, from the bullet wound. And uh, he didn't show it at all. He must have been in a great deal of pain because shoulder wounds are Eddie. And uh, he, uh, he he went through it. Yeah. It was a big wedding there. All of Macheki farming here was the, the city clan with from South Africa. Uh, so it was like 400 guests. Um, the, the wedding was at the RLI Hall. And on uh, in the RLI barracks, there uh, was a big hall there, and uh, oh, it was a huge place, and uh, uh, that's where we got married. Yeah. So yeah, so now I'm a married man, moved into a flat with Annie in uh, Avondale, and my new posting was the uh, GC Special Branch Base at uh, 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 Borodo Rural. Uh, the course sign was uh, one two five Alpha, and base. At that base, initially, um, was GCSB, and the boss was an SO Gray Barker, the late Gray Barker. Uh, Gray, I had known Gray from uh, the support unit days, um, where, uh, in, back to, going back to 1975, when Gray was in the support unit. He used to come in, and I was queuing up the town. And um, uh, there was also an SIS stick uh, um, that was attached to Gray, um, the uh, the stick was commanded by uh, uh, Richard Fiddler, who was ex-support unit. 
Billy McKenzie was the um, Ellen, uh, Ellen Schultz, Ellen Shaw. Um, I forget the names of the other guys, but uh, those are the guys that uh, that made up the, the section. My responsibility was uh, uh, intelligence work for mainly a Borodal farming area, um, Borodal itself, and then later on, uh, uh, Chinamora was added. Now, Chinamora, yeah, there was a tug of war going on here above my pay grade between Salops, which I came under, and uh, 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 Jock Bendura. And Jock Bendura always said Chinamora fell under them, and Salops says no, Chinamora falls under us, and it was never really sorted out. And they thought that I would then come to grips with the guys uh, doing the SFA work and uh, intelligence work in uh, Chinamora. It was a bloke called Dave Nixon, the late Dave Nixon. Now, what people didn't know is uh, Dave and I were lifelong friends. Going back to Marandellas High, we were locked together uh, at rugby, uh, etc. And uh, we therefore clicked. Of course we did. So never mind the hondo that was going on above our heads, but Dave and I worked well together. And uh, that's how the whole thing started off. Richard Fiddler and co are put on an, on an OP. They, uh, um, they see terrorists, but it's quite a long way off. 400 meters, um, no fire force available. They were busy somewhere else. So Richard said, I'm not going to waste this. And it's one of the best shots I have ever seen or heard of. With this FN over open sights, Richard Fiddler shot this tourist through the head at 400 meters. Now, that's something I have never seen repeated or before or, or after over open sights, I tell you. No, no, no scope. I then move into Chinamora semi-permanently. So now I've got two officers, one in, uh, at the SIS, uh, at the um, uh, at 125 Alpha, and one at Call Sign 78, which was the SFA base. Now, SFA had, there were the Muzureva faction, they had two bases in Chinamora and Masana, um, a total of almost 300 men commanded by uh, Dave, uh, Dave Nixon. And um, also with him was uh, Billy Prentice, also a good friend of mine. And both Dave and Bill were extra fortunate. It was a hot area. Uh, uh, um, there were contacts almost daily between the SFA and the tourists. But basically, there were never any casualties. They all basically used to shoot, shoot the shit out of the sky and walk away from it, you know. Um, until one day, I was actually back at uh, 125, which was um, the Salops North Base run by um, Inspector the late, oh, geez, what was his name? Mm -hmm. Dave Fowler. Uh, and his number two was also ex at the late Barry Wern. And um, I was there liaising with him on something or other, and... Over the radio, we get news that uh, there'd been an ambush, that it was Dave Nixon's vehicle that had been ambushed, that he'd driven through the ambush and was on his way to, to the base. Now this Land Rover arrives. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. Now, Dave was the only person alive in that Land Rover. Um, the two SFA next to him were dead. On the back of the vehicle were another six SFA dead. The vehicle had over 50 strikes on it, but David was totally untouched. And he just sat there like a robot, you know, with his hands on the steering wheel, looking straight ahead. And he was just like, What is gone. SFA? SFA? Uh, Security Force Auxiliaries. Okay. They were initially, they were started with his comrade Max in the Masana, was the first SFA. And they were all meant to be uh, uh, terrorists who had gone over to our side. But at the end of the day, like out of the 300 SFA we had, in Chinamura and Masana, there was maybe 15 ex-terrorists, and the rest were just Mujibas, youth, etc. They had been recruited off the street, you know, getting some money, yeah. getting a weapon in their hands, you know, minimal training. Although uh, some of the ex-terrorists, they were quite good. Anyway, um, just going back to this, 
Um, yeah, I had to price Dave's hands off the steering wheel, take him inside, give him a few whiskeys, and you, you know, just to wake the man up. And Dave, after that, suffered from very bad PTSD, you know. Uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah, shame. Fast forward a few weeks. Okay, Lancaster House Conference is about starts or has just started. Um, op Enterprise is underway. And, uh, okay, we're on the edge of Op Enterprise, but we're not really part of it. Okay. But the so-called Salisbury Detachment, whose uh, detachment commander was a fellow called Big Brain Chavada, and those were the guys that hit the petrol dumps, um, decided that uh, our base was an easy target. Now, I got wind of the attack through the sources, and I said, Dave, right, tonight we are going to be attacked, you know. And I don't know how strong the attacking force is going to be, but we must reckon there's at least 50 of them. So what Dave and I did is we walked around the base and we identified every likely firing position we could find. Dave had his, at his disposal 181, and he had two or three 60s. I can't remember whether two or three. Dave himself ran the 81, and an ex Zangla heavy weapons fellow called... Oh, what was he called? Anyway, doesn't matter. He he had the 60s. And what we did then is we zeroed the mortars into the firing position. So we had the exact coordinates of every single likely firing position at the mortar pits. Then the real strong possibilities, Dave took himself, and then uh, 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 the, the SFA man took the others. The attack commenced at round about midnight. And uh, basically, uh, um, I was manning the one corner bunker. I was, by then, I was carrying an RPK, uh, uh, carried an RPK for the last three years of the war from 1978 onwards. Um, Dave was on the, on the mortar, and Bill Prentice had a, I think it was called a Dectoref. Um, one of these um, heavy machine guns, seven six two long, rimmed cartridge, a uh, very slow rate of fire, but it, you know you could fire that thing all day. Um, he was manning that. Now, as I attacked, as I got attacked, I found that it was very easy to walk my fire into the the flashes in front of me. You know the the, um, the flashes from from the shooting. And uh, every third round I had was tracer, so it was easy. It's just walk your fire into um, into their fire. There was a huge explosion um, right in front of our by our bunker. Um, the whole bunker shook, and uh, I later found out it was what uh, the terrorists called the RPG twelve. The RPG twelve is uh, it's a misnomer. It was a three and a half inch. Um, uh, rocket launcher, a World War II vintage, uh, an American weapon. Now, incidentally, this was exactly the weapon that took out, uh, that attacked us that night. This was the weapon that also took out the um, the petrol dumps. After a while, there is no return fire, so uh, we call cease fire. And at first light, the following morning, we go around and uh, inspect the scene. Now, what we found was uh, first... A recordless rifle, 75 mil recordless rifle of a Chinese manufacturer, and one round of ammunition up the spout. Um, it, it was the weapon was on a tripod, and when we put the uh, but on its back, so when we put the weapon back up again, it pointed straight at my bunker. So, yeah, I had a lucky escape. Um, we found four dead terrorists, um, a whole lot of weaponry and, uh, and stuff. And there was quite a bit of blood spool from the scene. So uh, we called in uh, dogs uh, um, and uh, uh, Salops put some call signs on. And on Spore, we found another two dead terrorists. So basically, that detachment had suffered six casualties attacking our base and lost the recorder's rifle. But the heart of the detachment was still, attacked, uh, was still intact. And from there, they went on to attack the petrol dumps, and you know what happened there. Um, to this day, 
it is uh, a mystery to me. How? Because by then, Salisbury uh, should have been ringed with a ring of steel. Every, every road should have had uh, roadblocks on it. These guys got into a Rixie taxi and drove it through the Missouri Road, no roadblocks, straight up to uh, the railway line. And it was across the railway line that they saw the petrol dumps attacked and destroyed the petrol dumps. You know, uh, how that was allowed to happen is, as I say, a mystery to me. Um, from there, of course, um, we we hunted them down. And it wasn't just me. Uh, maybe Tom Dick and Harry was after them. Um, but of interest is uh, one of them, uh, 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 the first day decided to hit what they thought was Bishop Mazzarivo's house. And of course, they uh, got the right, they got a bishop, but just not Mazzarivo. It was the Greek, uh, the, the, the bishop of the Greek Orthodox Church, whose house was attacked and riffed by them, but thank God, no casualties. They then decided, and these were active buggers, they then decided to hit Salops North, um, which was located in a private house right next to Borodale Police Station. They hit a house, but they hit the house next door, which was a private family, by mistake. And they initiated the attack. Uh, okay, it was seven in the evening, believe it or not. The family was sitting down to dinner, and they initiated the attack by putting an RPG-7 through the kitchen wall. It should have killed the family, but it didn't. And the reason is, the piece of wall they fired through on the other side was a fridge. So the rocket exploded into the fridge, and there was just pieces of fridge everywhere, but thank God, no lives were lost. Um, realizing their mistake, they ran away. Uh, they didn't press the attack in any way. I think they probably realized that they got the wrong house. Um, then one of them lost their, uh, lost their life, and for this, the, the PO concerned got a medal. Um, it was one or two days later. It was a Sunday afternoon. And I was actually sitting at uh, at Misaka Base, is what we called it, on Two Five Alpha. My then also um, BES uh, SP Special Project has, had moved into One Two Five Alpha, so it was quite a busy place. And uh, a house girl in Avondale had gone to her madam and said, "Listen, there is a strange man in the car, and he's got a weapon, and he's visiting my daughter." So this report was made to Avondale, also went out to us. We got into our vehicles and raced in, but of course the PO from Avondale with his constable and his trusty P1 got there first. And he went into the car, saw the guy lying there with his girlfriend, and next to the guy was an RPK. The guy went for the RPK, and the patrol officer shot him at point black range with his P1. And for that, I gave him a medal, and why not? You know, taking on an... Uh, an RPK with a P1, you know, it takes some doing. And so one by one, the whole of the Salisbury detachment were accounted for, um, including Big Brain Chibada. And then, of course, um, the conference uh, is finished and we have ourselves a ceasefire. Um, I get transferred from Chinamora back to Devon Tree House. I'm now doing proper special branch work as a member of EDESC. EDES stands for European Desk. Um, later on, EDEX was to become counterintelligence under uh, CIO, but that was still some time in the future. And speaking four languages and being of German origin, uh, obviously, you, it is pretty obvious what my targets are. You know, I'm doing a lot of translating and this sort of thing. Um, but they then transfer me on to St. Mary's. St. Mary's looks after Chitanguiza. Chitanguiza is this city, and that's what it is, of over one million people sitting next to Salisbury. And basically, that's everybody that works in Salisbury. That's where most of them live. Um, it's made up in the in the original St. Mary's Township, and then there is what they call Zangeza, Zangeza 1, 2, 3, and 4. And a refugee camp uh, that is known as Chiramba Huyo. Now, Chiramba Huyo, impossible to map. A couple of hundred thousand people there, and they just built their huts wherever they could, 
stinking to high heaven because there's no running water or anything like that. Um, and the tourists from all the nearby assembly points used uh, Churambahuyo as a uh, holiday place. They used to go in r and and visit their girlfriends, etc. So, but we had plenty of informants in that area. So uh, on a regular basis, uh, we used to uh, get called. So, you know, there's a guy there with his girlfriend. And then we went in and raided the place, arrested him. But aside from sending him back to his unit, so to speak, to his assembly point, there's nothing we could do. Then it's coming up to the election time. And uh, what we did at EDESC e is we had a whole bunch of reporters. Uh, we had a whole bunch of European reservists, and we decked them out to be reporters. And what we wanted to do is we sent them into um, into Chitimbiza and all the other townships around the Rari to gauge, to gauge the, um, the mood of the people. And the info we came back with was not the info that our bosses wanted to hear. Basically, uh, uh, what they came back with was that the likelihood was very high that Mugabe would win the election. They didn't want to believe us, but there you are. Um, then our South African friends uh, sprang into action, and uh, myself and a few other guys were called in early one morning to uh, the container park. Container was open. Opened and a whole lot of newspapers came out. Moto. Moto was a magazine published by the Catholic Church. Uh, the press was in Guela and it was very pro Zardo PF. And this fake Moto uh, basically had articles in it that were uh, designed to run Mugabe down, run Zardo PF down, mm -hmm. and help Muzurewa. Uh, uh, win the war. So we became newspaper delivery boys. Um, myself and uh, I forget now who I was with. Um, we were given the Umtani side of things. So that morning we drove out in our newspaper delivery vehicle and we delivered these fake motors from Ruwa to Merendellas to Rusabi all the way to Umtani and then came back. Um, of course, it never did a thing. Yeah. Um, then I know there was an attempt by us to influence the vote itself, where I believe fake ballot boxes had been produced, but they were never delivered. I do know that we never included them in the mix, so to speak. Um, the operation was started, the ballot boxes were completed, with people sitting there ticking off ballot papers, but um. A call came in from uh, Red Bricks from SBHQ that uh, we were not going to go. We weren't going to go through with it, and we didn't. And yeah, and then I was sitting uh, in the pub at uh, at the police station, the main police station in Salisbury, and I remember sitting there in the window. It was three floors up, and every Tom Dick and Harry was there. The radio was on full, and we were listening to the election results. Yeah. And, I then found out that Bob had won. You know, that was the end of my war. Uh, I remember saying to myself, now, what on earth did I spend the last six years doing, you know, to have this result? But uh, one can now philosophize on it. Uh, I don't know. But uh, that was the end of my war. Um, at that stage, uh, there was all sorts of shit going down in Salisbury, so uh, I sent Annie, and by then uh, uh, I'd become a father, my daughter Natasha and Annie, I sent them to the farm, because now the farm is safer than the city. <laughs> and Annie and, and Natasha spent the next 10 weeks, uh, not 10 weeks, 10 days, 2 weeks, at the farm, and I stayed on in Salisbury, and yeah, we were putting out fires everywhere. Um, I was one of the people that greeted the plane of the Zanla commanders coming in. One of them I greeted as I observed it. Uh, Rex Nonga coming off the plane. And in the departure hall, I remember 
I forget now, it was somebody, it was a, a diplomat, whether Cuban or Russian, I can't remember, walking up to Rex Nono, giving you a suitcase. Rex Nono opened it, and it's just full of US dollars. And I thought, yeah, you know, that's the company, the funds for whatever, yeah. Okay, we now go into post-war. Um, I'm still in space. CIO were only formed in 1981, so I remain a member of Special Branch. Um, colleagues of mine were leaving the country in droves. Um, and uh, Samora Michelle comes for his first visit. And uh, Jameson Avenue became Samora Michelle Avenue. And Charlie Hand and myself were uh, designated to uh, protect Samora Michelle. Uh, he had his own security people, but we were the, by then, Zimbabwean side of security. We didn't get on with the guys from, with the Mozambican guys. They didn't like us. We didn't like them. And, you know, by now you're in a situation where uh, Bob, uh, Samora Michelle was staying in the presidential suite at the Monomotapa. And when he was up there, and Charlie and, and I were, were downstairs, and some Zanla guy coming up to me, and you know, five foot, five foot zero, looking up at me and saying, "I'm not scared of you." So I said, "Fine, you know." So what? You know, no, they're big heroes. Um, what was of interest from that visit um, uh, was um, alarm bells going off. Uh, Charlie and I sitting down there. The next thing is fire alarm. And it's coming from the floor below the residential suite. So Charlie got up. Charlie and I thought, well, shit, maybe this is a prelude to some sort of attack by somebody. So we head into the lift, go up there. And somebody had left a television on in a room and put a blanket over the TV. Whole thing overheats, the blanket caught fire, fire alarm. So Charlie and I put out the fire, ruining our suits in the process. And uh, I remember. A thick for hotel management gave us a free dinner for two each at uh, one of the Monomotapa's restaurants. Yeah. So, yeah, um, then, of course, all the embassies come back. Um, so, uh, uh, Denis Stenard was liaising with the South African embassy and with Boss. Uh, Mike Crafter was liaising with the Brits, who by then put in MR5. Or was it number six? I forget now. One of them, and then me being German, I'm liaising with the German embassy <coughs> and the officially declared representatives of the BND, the Bundesnachrichtendienst. And between the BND and MR5 and the CIA, um, who were also being liaised with Bob Crafter, there is now a race to help uh, equip control. Get some sort of measure of control over the newly formed CIO, which is made up out of ex special branch, ex CIO, um, the overseas side of of the Rhodesian Intelligence Service, and ex uh, intelligence services from both Zanla and Zipra. And initially, I had an office at Red Bricks on the top floor, and I was tasked with training four of the people uh, to Zanla to Zipra. And uh, it wasn't an easy task. Uh, let me tell you, I I felt a lot more at home with the Zipra people than with the Zandra people. Um, the Zipra guys were, you could talk to them, you know, they, were they, were, they weren't all over you like the Zandra guys. Um, the Zandra guy, uh, one of them, had been the stick commander that uh, had killed Tim Peach back in Macheki during the war. And Tim Peach was killed in a particularly cruel way. And this little ship would raise the subject of Tim Peach every chance he had. And many a time did I make a fist in my pocket. I just wanted to beat the shit out of this little guy. But uh, I did not, you know. Uh, I just lived through it. Um, then we have the attack on Mugabe's house. Uh... Mugabe is now president, the presidential residence is attacked by uh, people from Zanla, but they were all ex-Zipra guys from Bulawayo. Basically a 2-5. It, it was a drive-by shooting, totally ineffectual. 
they um, they drove past Mugabe's house, shot the shit out of the guards, and uh, drove on. And headed for Bulawayo. Now I'm put in charge of the investigation of this. And I very quickly find out who the commander of this was, a Lieutenant Subanda. And I had to say to myself, Sitik, how successful do you want to be in this? You know, uh, did I really want them caught? Um, I mean, I can say that now. Uh, I actually didn't. Um, but the Zanla people that came with me were very determined. And in typical fashion, we talked about this electricity thing early on. Uh, Zanla knew how to use them. And, you know, it was almost like they used every telephone in Bulawaya to interrogate people. Um, and it wasn't long after that that I resigned. I, I said, I don't need this. Uh, and uh, that was the end of my career, 1983. Yeah. Ken Flower, did you have much to do with him? No. Um, the, the people I reported to were uh, Chris Hooker and Dan Stenart. Um, my interaction with Mr. Flower was zero. I know what you might be talking about. My personal belief that Mr. Flower was not a sellout at all. Um, uh, yes. Um, we found out who the spy was in uh, Come Ops. Um, that was one of, okay, it's one of the things that I forgot to talk about. The spy in Come Ops. We found uh, 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 basically in 1981, uh, eDesk, uh, which now also had counterintelligence responsibility. We we found out that there had been a, a spy, a Zipra spy, in Comops in in the main ops room, and he was nothing more than the corporal who was tasked with doing all the maps. He used to come in first light every morning and did all the maps of all the ops that were going on, both internal and external. Now this little corporal had access to everything because he did all the maps, and it's quite simple. He put a phone call through to a number in Botswana which he was able to do. He, I don't know how he reported, but the the the, the info concern was put to Botswana, then from Botswana up to Lusaka, and that's how they got hold of quite a bit of information on our externals, etc. Now, um, we dealt with that corporal, or he was dealt with, let's put it this way. And Danny Stannard, a lot of people have pointed fingers at him. I worked... For Dan Stannard for a long time, from 1976 right through to the bitter end. I got to know the man quite well. He didn't work for anybody. Um, he steered our ship through very difficult waters, and uh, I have nothing but the highest respect for the man. Excellent. Yeah. Hans, thanks so much, man. Uh, it's been incredibly interesting. Um, and um, I'm sure that our viewers will... Uh, find it very informative um okay thank you yeah is that it are we done you know john there's been so much in those six years <laughs> we probably not but at the moment yeah. i can't remember <laughs> all right i'll tell you what yeah. if um if there are other anecdotal stories um maybe whole ops or whatever that you forgot to talk about um please Let's do a follow up, you know. I mean, there's yeah. there's no um reason for us to limit um you know the whole purpose of this thing is to record history. So if there's yeah. valid history that's been omitted, then let's let's record it, you know. Um yeah, yeah. okay. Um John, let's play it by ear. Um, yeah. uh, I'm certainly very happy to to do another interview. 